Jeremiah chapter 6, reading verses 13 through 16 from the King James text, the Word of God reads as follows. For from the least of them, even unto the greatest of them, everyone is given to covetousness. And from the prophet, even unto the priest, everyone dealeth falsely. They have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. Therefore they shall fall among them that fall. At the time that I visit them, they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways, and see, and ask for the old paths, where is the good way, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, We will not walk therein. Amen. I want to talk to us on the topic. Go back to move ahead. If you'll bow your heads with me one more moment. Father, once again, God, we love you and we're grateful for this hour when the Word of God is to be broken for the benefit of God's people. The bread of life today, O oh God, that brings truth to our spirit and allows us to be liberated, Master, today by the grace of God through faith. Master, today I ask God that the anointing of the Holy Ghost would rest upon your messenger. Lord, help me to deliver the message that you've laid upon my heart for this hour for your people. For there is no benefit, there is no benefit for the people of God outside of the anointed, preached Word of God. And I rely so heavily upon you this day. Master, ask God that you would anoint the ear of every hearer as well. Help the hearer to receive that which they will hear at this time. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. You know, I've talked in the past about how the Lord will sometimes give me messages and I get my notes all put together, you know. And primarily my notes are just scriptures. That's primarily all I, I put. I don't, I'm don't. i not the kind of preacher who does an outline and all of my sermons are, you know, I have three points. That's how a lot of preachers preach, and that's not how I preach. That's not the way that, that I deliver the messages God gives me. But there are times when the Lord will give me a message, and then before Sunday comes, he gives me another message. And I say, well, now, Lord, wait a minute. Now i got two messages. Now I have to ask him, which one do I preach when? And he'll tell me. Say, I want you to preach this one this week. So then I'll push this other message back. Well, the Lord gave this message to me weeks ago. Weeks ago. And then each Sunday, he'd give me a subsequent message. And I said, now, Lord, wait a minute. What are you doing to me? So this message has been pushed back and pushed back until today. So if you're watching and you're listening to this message today, whether it's live, whether it's by reason of recording, I've got news for you, friend. It, God has to be in it, amen, because he, he's timed this thing in just such a way that it would be spoken today. And this is a message that very much has a prophetic tone, although there is certainly application for each individual believer. It is, in fact, primarily a message to the church of the living God universal. All those today who would call themselves 
uh, children of God, all those who had called themselves Christians and born again believers. If you've ever been stuck in the mud or in a difficult position with your vehicle, then you know sometimes the best way to gain traction so you can move forward is to first back your car up so you can get a running start, amen, and get some inertia going. Tommy and I went on an infamous trip some years ago. I was very much wanting, for years I wanted to find some property out in the country. I mean, out in the boondocks, off grid, you know, no electric, no water, no gas, no nothing. I wanted to be out in the boondocks. I love the country. I grew up in Connecticut. Connecticut is a very small state. It doesn't have a great population. There are a few major population areas like Waterbury, Hartford, and New Haven. Uh, but for the most part, it's a very rural state. They say that only 30% of the land in the state of Connecticut is uh, land that has been uh, built on and what have you. So 70% of it is just forests and, and lakes and mountains and I love that environment and I missed it. Tommy and I have been living here in Dallas all these years and I kept telling him, I said, man, I'm telling you, I've got to get some property out in the boondock somewhere because I love to get away and be out somewhere where it's quiet and there's wildlife and you're just surrounded by trees and I tried to explain to him how primal it is and how you feel so connected to the earth and you feel so connected you know to the planet when you're in that environment and I would describe it and he'd just give me that goofy look on his face like he didn't understand me he still don't understand what I'm talking about but I finally was researching for years I researched land and uh, I never could quite find anything I was interested in looking at. I finally found some property and it was up in the mountains of Oklahoma, East Oklahoma, the eastern part of the state. And uh, I talked to the guy on the phone and all I had for a car back then was my Dodge minivan, my, my little Dodge minivan. And I asked this fellow, I said, now, can you drive a regular car on the gravel road that goes up to this property? And he said, well, we recommend a 4 by 4 if you got it. He said, but I, I think you could probably make it with a regular car. I don't know what on earth made that man say that. So... We made the trip, and it was four hours' drive to get there, you know. We got to the base of the mountain. We found the little gravel road we had to take, and we started on this little gravel road. And at first, it wasn't so bad. It was just gravel, you know, and it wasn't so bad. It was narrow. You know, it was overgrown on either side. It wasn't a wide road or anything, but I mean, I could manage it. But the further we went, the worse it got. The road suddenly began to expose all these stones and all these rocks. And there was sand in between them. And it had rained fairly recently. So while it wasn't muddy per se, it was uh, still damp. You know, the soil was still a bit damp. And we're going down these declines and up these inclines and around these bends and oh my Lord. And the further we went, the worse it got and the worse it got and the worse it got. And finally the road was no more gravel. It was just all these exposed stones. Looked like a washed out river bed. And I mean it was rough. And there was, we were at the top of this decline. And I mean, you look down, and it went down at least probably 60 feet or so. And it was pretty steep. 
and Tommy kept asking me, are you sure you want to try this? Are you sure you want to see that man? And I just keep telling him over and over again. I said, listen, I came to see that land and by God, I'm going to see it. I didn't drive all these hours out here to Oklahoma so I could turn around and go home. Yeah, I'm going to see that land. So I went ahead and drove down this thing. Tommy said, we may get down, but I doubt we'll get up again. But we drove down that and we went and then we actually had to drive through a little creek bed and there was water running through. We had to drive through that and get to the other side of it and go up and man the road just got worse and worse by the foot. So finally after crossing that creek bed and trying to go up and around this little bit of rough, rough, rough road, I finally said, you know what, I don't think we're more than probably 300 feet from the lot that I was trying to look at. I said, but I, I don't think we can do this today. I said, I, I don't, you know, there's no way this car can go the rest of this route. You should have seen this road. It was a mess. So I did about a hundred point turn so I could turn around this little narrow, just horribly rocky road, you know. And I turned my little van around and I started going back and I went through the the uh, stream bed, you know. And then I went up and then we're at the base of that big old incline that we had come down. And Tommy said, we may get down, but I doubt we'll get back up. Well, I knew the best way I was going to get up that hill, I'd better start as far back as I could. So I tried to start as close to that little creek as I could and get as much of a running start. But the road was, there was sand and there was rocks and it was a bit damp and my tires would spin so I really couldn't get good traction. And we'd go and we'd start going up that hill a little bit and my little tires are just spinning and spinning. And we'd get up, I'd say, oh, probably 15 feet. <laughs> <laughs> out of 60 at least and no it wasn't going to happen so I'd have to back it down again and I'd back it down again and I'd go back as far as I could go and then I'd try to find me a good running start and I'd have the same problem every time those wheels had just been I'd get up so far and it wasn't going to happen then I said well maybe if I favor this side of the road or maybe if I favor that side of the road if I can just catch where that rock is over there or if I can just catch where that little bit of gravel is over over there maybe I can get enough traction well honey guess what it didn't happen for all my efforts it didn't happen we wound up sitting there for a while I made I don't know how many attempts then finally we called the fire department and we told them and they said well uh, here's the number for a wrecker you can call and they'll come out and pull you out of there so we had to call us a wrecker service and these fellas come, oh child, they was this country and hick. And, I mean, you talk about being redneck, you know. One of them, big old scraggly beard and just, just overalls and look like something crawled out of a bad movie. <laughs> and the other one... Bless his heart, he was a younger fellow. I don't even want to try to describe him because you'd think I was being mean <laughs> if I just tried to describe this poor kid. Missing teeth and, I mean, they was just a wreck looking. And when they showed up, there's me with Black Tommy. And I thought, oh Jesus, we're both going to get killed because the KKK runs the local record service. <laughs> well, as it happens... They were the nicest fellas in the world. They really, really were. And they helped us and they, you know, dropped a line down there off the front of their wrecker and they attached it to my Dodge and they pulled us up the hill. And then he told me once they got us up the hill and all, he said, now I'm going to keep an eye on you as I'm driving out. 
in my rear view to make sure you're following. He said, I want to make sure you're able to get all the way out of here. He said, do you know that I've seen brand new Dodge pickups, 4x4s, burn out their transmissions trying to get up this incline. That I've literally seen a brand new Dodge one time. The guy burned out his transmission trying to get up this incline. He said he couldn't make it. He said I had to come pull him out. He said, but I had to pull him all the way to a shop because his truck wasn't running. It was a miracle that he pulled us out and, and our van still ran. You know, I could still drive it. And I drove it home and I never had any trouble with it uh, after that. So that was all God. But he drove ahead of us, you know, watched in his mirror to make sure we got out. And thank God we made it to the highway. We were able to drive home. I never did see that property. But if you've ever been in a position where you're stuck, most of us know if you get into a sandy spot or sometimes you get into a muddy spot, kind of like the illustration I have behind my head today, if you get into a muddy or sandy spot, a lot of times somebody who knows what they're talking about is going to say to you, put it in reverse, am I telling the truth? Because you can have it in forward gear and all you're going to do is keep spinning your wheel. They say, no, no, no. Put it in reverse. Go backward. And if you'll put that thing in reverse, a lot of times your, your car is able to actually get traction to get out of a hole so long as you're going backward and not forward. Well, I'm here to tell you today, a lot of believers are in a bad spiritual place. They're not progressing. They're not moving forward in the Lord. They're not growing. They're not prospering. They're not being blessed. Something is wrong because they feel like they're just spinning their wheels. And I'm here to tell you today, according to Jeremiah chapter 6, there is a prescription for those who, who are stuck in a bad place. First of all, I want to tell you today what Jeremiah described, the prophet Jeremiah, what he described in the 6th chapter, verses 13 through 16, is very much what we're seeing in the church today. He talks about the fact that the leadership is poisoned and the leadership in the church is perverted and that they are driven only by covetousness meaning want they want something they want money they want popularity they want fame they want celebrity whatever it is it is not a desire to please the Lord and to do what God has called them to do. I want to tell you something, folks. I've been in ministry a long time. I've known a lot, a lot, a lot of preachers. And I've known a lot of them that are wonderful, good, solid people. I mean, they work for the Lord. All they want to do is see people saved. They want to see people helped. They want to see people healed. They want the church to be a blessing to their community. They want to live the way that God wants them to live. And then I've met some preachers that I wouldn't give you a plug nickel for. I've actually had people say to me, and, and how anybody could say this, I'll never understand. I've actually had people say to me, well, my preacher, he's all about money. That's all he's about is money. But, oh, he can really preach it. Boy, I mean, he can really preach you happy. He can really preach, you know, the folks till they're shouting and screaming and hollering. And boy, so that's why I go to his church, even though he's all about the money. 
man, I'm going to tell you something. You couldn't pay me enough money to be in a church with a preacher whose primary motivation for being in ministry is to make money. Mm -hmm. you, couldn't, you couldn't give me nothing for that, for nothing in the world. I don't have time for that foolishness. But we're in a position in the church world today the Word of God said in the last days that they would make merchandise of God's people. And this is the environment that we're in. Preachers and leaders in the Christian community, in the church world, are full of covetousness. And they're dealing falsely with God's people. They say what people want to hear in order to soothe them a little. Saying peace, peace, when there is no peace. I'm going to tell you, I've, I've known great men of God that I admired and I appreciated who were part of various denominations that I have been friends with for all these years. And I've known great men of God who've gotten up in the pulpit and told their congregations in those denominations, oh, the church has never been in a better place than it is right now. Oh, the church has never been better than it is right now. And I'm going to tell you, that is a lie from the pit of hell. And it bothered me when I would see these men telling the people of God that the church was in better shape than it's ever been before when that is not even remotely the case. We are not seeing miracles in the church like we used to see miracles. We are not seeing the gifts of the Spirit operating in the church like we used to see the gifts of the Spirit operating in the church. Boy, I'm going to tell you, when I was a kid, our little Assembly of God church that I grew up in in southern New England, we used to have tongues with interpretation on a regular basis in our church. I mean regularly. If, 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 if it didn't happen every Sunday, it happened pretty near every Sunday. Now let me explain something to y'all. Some people will tell you that prophecy and tongues with interpretation are basically interchangeable. They're one and the same. No, they're not. They serve very different functions. The Bible said that prophecy is for the benefit of the believer. Tongues with interpretation, listen, the scripture said that is a sign to the unbeliever. So believe it or not, when you're in a Pentecostal church service and somebody all of a sudden begins to utter a message in an unknown tongue and everybody in the congregation quiets down and lets them deliver that message in tongues and then somebody else or the person who delivered the message, it can be either or, uh, then speaks the interpretation of that message. According to the Word of God, that entire transaction is for the benefit of unbelievers. It's a sign to unbelievers. Because it's a sign to unbelievers, generally a message with tongues and interpretation is going to be aimed at or speaking to Guess who? The unbeliever. And when a message with tongues and interpretation comes forth, then it ought to be a message, and usually it would be a message, the Lord would speak to the unbeliever in the congregation, and He'd say, I love you, I care about you, I want the best for you. I'm calling you to come. I'm calling you to come to me. I want to heal you. I want to bless you. I want to save you. Whatever, you know. But it would be a message in that tone, okay? And I remember growing up as a kid. Whew, we used to have those 
messages with tongues and interpretation. You say, well, why does God do that? Well, I'm not exactly sure because I'm not God. So I'm not exactly sure why. But my best guess would be that when the Lord gives a message with tongues, the rest of the believers in the church are supposed to be able to discern that this is a message, not just the individual praying or not just the individual worshiping, but rather that it is a message God is trying to, to deliver. And when you discern that, then your responsibility is to hush so that that message can come forth. Well, when you're in a church... Say you're an unbeliever. You ain't never been in a Pentecostal church before. And all of a sudden, everybody's worshiping and praying and singing, or maybe even the preacher's preaching. And then all of a sudden, somebody started, and the whole congregation, preacher stops preaching. Everybody in the congregation goes dead silent. And all you hear is that message in another language that you can't understand. And then somebody else in the congregation or maybe the person who delivered the message, but somebody then afterwards, because nobody speaks, after a message is delivered, nobody speaks until the interpretation comes. That is the biblical protocol. You remain silent. After a message in tongues, you remain silent until the interpretation follows. Then the interpretation comes. Now, if you're an unbeliever, don't you think that that racket, somebody speaking a message in tongues, is kind of going to get your attention? Don't you think maybe that's going to draw your ear and kind of make you listen? And then if everybody stays quiet after that person has done that, what do you think your reaction is going to be when the interpretation comes? boom, immediately your ear is going to the interpretation. So this is like a trumpet to get your attention and then you have the person over here who is the, the crier, the town crier with the message. You follow what I'm saying? Now that would be my best guess why God does that. But do you know I've been in Pentecostal church after Pentecostal church after Pentecostal church in the last 25, 30 years, and you don't hardly even see tongues with interpretation in the church anymore. Forget about prophecy. What's the difference between prophecy and tongues and interpretation? The difference is prophecy is delivered in the language of understanding, meaning you, you deliver it in your own language. And when the Lord anoints somebody to prophesy, basically they do the same thing as the person with the message in tongues does. They just speak it out. They just deliver it. Now the Bible said the spirit of the prophet is subject unto the prophet. So therefore, they can kind of hold on until the right break in the service, you know, until the right moment, until things are quiet enough where they can begin to speak and the people will, will hear them and will silence. And again, when somebody's prophesying, then the church goes silent. Everybody quiets. Everybody's silent so they can hear what is being prophesied. But see, the church doesn't need the precursor of tongues. That's for the unbeliever. The church is able, the Bible said, try the Spirit, see whether it be of God or not. The church, the people of God are able to weigh and to discern the Spirit that is coming through that individual, you know, delivering that message. And most of the time, of course, it's the Lord, you know. Uh, but there are times when a demoniac or something will come into church, and we won't go into that. Anyway, so the point I'm trying to make is, we're in a place today in the church world where we're not seeing the gifts of the Spirit operating like they used to operate. We're not seeing a word of wisdom. We're not seeing a word of knowledge. 
We're not seeing tongues with interpretation. We're not seeing the gifts of healings. We're not seeing the working of miracles. We're not seeing those things that not too very long ago we saw with great, with much greater consistency and frequency. In 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 3 and 4, the Apostle Paul writes to the church, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So the Apostle Paul says, the Lord's return is going to be preceded by two things. Number one, a great falling away within the church. And secondly, the Antichrist will be revealed. And the Antichrist will set him up. Listen, the way Paul worded it. He said, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. In other words, the Antichrist is not only going to exalt himself above the, the God of Christianity, but he is going to exalt himself above every idol and every false god that can be named on this planet so that he has exalted himself above all that is called God or all that is worshipped. While many today view the church world as a pasture full of sheep with the occasional wolf dis disguised as one of us mixed in the crowd, listen to me children, the truth is that's not what the Lord said. The Lord did not say I send you forth as sheep with the occasional wolf. So what he said, listen, Jesus said that he sent us forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. You know what that means? That means there's more wolves than there are sheep. <laughs> there's more wolves than there are sheep. It's a much more dangerous place to be when you're the wandering sheep and you wander into a pack of wolves than it is when you're a pack of sheep or a herd of sheep and a wolf happens to wander into the pack. Do you follow what I'm telling you? But that is not the case. He said, I send you forth as sheep among wolves. He said, honey, i got news for you. All around you, every direction you look in, there's going to be somebody who would be just as happy to devour you. Somebody who would be just as happy to profit from you. Somebody who would be just as happy to benefit from you. Matthew 10, 16, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. The notion of a false prophet as a wolf disguised as a sheep only serves to help us understand that those who seek to do harm and visit destruction upon God's people are not going to stand out from the congregation of saints. But rather, they'll seek to appear as one of us in an effort to appear harmless. In Matthew 7, 15, the Lord said, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. 
While many today refuse to acknowledge that the church has slidden from its proper state into a backslidden, worldly, carnal state, obsessed with attaining and exercising political and social influence, rather than being busy about the Master's business, there are some who will hear the word of the Lord and acknowledge that we as a people are not where we ought to be. We are not doing what we ought to be doing. We are not living and experiencing what God would have us live and experience. As hard as it may be to hear, if we're to move forward and make ground as the church of the living God, we must acknowledge that we're stuck in a very bad place. Amen. You know the old saying, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But I got another saying for you. If you can't acknowledge it's broken, then you can't fix it. Mm -hmm. Amen. As long as you keep claiming it's all right, then you can't fix it. Church, I got news for you today. God's church needs some fixing. That's why every Sunday I pray for God to give us revival. That's why every Sunday I pray for God to give us a mighty move of the Holy Ghost because I'm not fool enough to stand here and tell you that the church is experiencing everything it ought to be experiencing and that we have everything we ought to have. In Ezekiel 37, verses 11 through 14, we... Ezekiel 37 is where we read the vision Ezekiel has of a valley full of dry bones. Valley full of bones. And listen to what the Lord said. In Ezekiel 37, 11 through 14, Then he, God, said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried. And our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And ye shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves. O my people, and brought you up out of your graves, and shall put my spirit in you, and ye shall live, and I shall place you in your own land. Then shall ye know that I, the Lord, have spoken it, and performed it, saith the Lord. Hallelujah. The only hope we have today for restoration and advancement is a word from the Lord. The word of God, the word of truth is alone able to speak life into a lifeless, backslidden church. In Amos chapter 8, verses 11 and 12, the Word of God declares, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east, they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord and shall not find it. I want to tell you today, children, we are in that time. There is a famine in the land. We are not hearing a word from God. There are preachers who are dealing falsely with God's people. If they were preaching the word of God, the fruit would be present. Mm -hmm. If they were preaching the truth of God, then there'd still be a move of God. If they were preaching the word of God, there'd still be miracles. If they were preaching the word of God, there'd still be the gifts of the Spirit operating in the church. The fact that all these things are absent reveal to us that there's a famine in the land. Mm -hmm. I know good and well when I get up to preach on Sunday 
that I don't preach messages like most preachers preach. I know that before I ever get up to preach. I know, listen, God called me to preach when I was eight years old. I preach exactly what God gives me, and like I told you earlier, I preach it when He tells me to preach it too. I don't just preach it, you know, half-heartedly whenever I feel like preaching. Oh, no, 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 no. The Word of God said that uh, a word fitly spoken is as apples of gold. In other words, when the right word comes at the right time, it's beneficial and it's a blessing. But you can preach the right word at the wrong time. You can say something good to a grieving person at the wrong time. And you know what? It just falls on deaf ears. But if you catch that person at the right time, the very self-same words will bless them and encourage them and inspire them and help them. So it's imperative that the preacher of the gospel not only preach what God gives them, but when the Lord tells them to deliver that message. Amen. The message today that cultivates true faith and causes our faith to grow and increase can only be found in the preached, pure, unadulterated Word of God. Romans 10, 17 tells us, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Immediately after sharing the parable of the unjust judge, the Lord Jesus Christ made this declaration in Luke 18 and 8. I tell you that he, the unjust judge, will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, he says, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. So the Lord is letting us know by the time he's due to return, there's going to be a faith shortage. If there's a faith shortage, there's only one reason for that. It's because there's a word shortage. The word of God is not being preached as it ought to be preached. If it were, then faith would be present because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Following this statement then, the Lord immediately began to share a parable that was meant to address the issue of self-righteousness and spiritual haughtiness. So immediately after the Lord said, I tell you, uh, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? The very next verse he said, And he spoke this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Our primary text today shares the truth that is necessary for restoration and advancement. If we are to make ground and move forward, we must first go backward and rediscover the old paths. While so many in the church are constantly trying new methods and new ways to try and meet the needs of God's people, the truth is we need to get back 
to the old time basics. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. And guess what those old time basics include? What the Lord just shared with us in Luke 18, 9 through 14. The old time basics include humility. See, you had the Pharisee who was so proud. Then you had the publican who was humble. Said, Lord, be merciful unto me, a sinner. Humility. We've got to get back to humility, people. We got to get back to the place where we recognize that that for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's right. There ain't nobody in this faith. There ain't nobody in this church perfect. There ain't nobody in this church righteous. All our righteousness is before the Lord as filthy rags. I'm gonna tell you. I remember as a kid. And I don't know about other churches. All I know is the church I grew up in. And I know being a preacher and being, I've been preaching now since I was 16 years old. And I'm going to tell you, I, and, and growing up, I was in youth groups and different youth uh, meetings. And we traveled to other churches and visited other churches. Back in the late 60s and early 70s, I'm going to tell you something, honey. The message that was preached in most Pentecostal churches was a pretty positive message. It was the message of love. It was the message of grace. It was a message to the unbeliever that God wanted to save them. He wanted to heal them. He wanted to deliver them. He wanted to help them. It was a pretty positive message. I'm going to tell you what you didn't see when I was a kid. You didn't see people sitting around judging one another and criticizing one another and uh, doing the way believers do today. We have people in the church I grew up in that I know for a fact, a couple of people in particular, I know for a fact, one man that if he wasn't gay, my name is John Smith, and another fella that it was known that he was doing some pretty awful things with one of his daughters. And yet... Nobody ever approached these people and mistreated them or, or you know, uh, ostracized them or, or did anything negative because the belief was as long as they were where the Word of God was being preached, maybe things could get right. The people in the church, we loved, we loved the folks whether we thought there might be something there that we didn't agree with or not. didn't matter. We, all we understood at that time was, well, we're, we're just called to love this person, period. It's not our job to sit in judgment of them, not our job to try to figure out what's going on in their personal life. We need to get back to a place of humility. We need the preached Word of God. We need to return to those things which worked in the past. New Coke. You remember? <laughs> remember when they come out with New Coke? My Lord, I tell you, New Coke lasted only a short time because most people, most consumers were not satisfied with the new formula for that cola. Before too long, Coca-Cola had to return to the old Coke, Coke formula or they'd lose their faithful customer base. Got news for you, children. So too, today, the church must seek out the old paths and return to that which worked in the past. Revelation 2, 1 through 5, unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars and has borne, and has patience, and for my name's sake has labored, and has not fainted. 
Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. I remember growing up as a child in the pew of a Pentecostal church in southern New England, you did not hear hateful, malicious, negative preaching like you do today, like is so prominent in the church today. The message was positive and Christ-exalting. The primary objective of God's people back then was love. You did not see the politic uh, politicization of the church. You did not see the vitriol and the division we see today. The spirit of Antichrist had not so engulfed the people of God that they loved violence and war and embraced deception with glee. We must remember what we used to be and how we used to conduct ourselves as God's people, we must repent, acknowledging we have strayed and gone the wrong way. Mm -hmm. We must do again that which we know to do. And we must do again that which works. So we might find restoration and enable ourselves to move forward in the work of God's kingdom. What is the work we're called to? 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 4, and I'm closing. Paul writes, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, or even the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. That's where we are today. Fables do not unleash the power of God in the church. Fables do not unleash the gifts of the Spirit in the church. Fables do not bring people to salvation. Fables do not inspire God's people to live as God would have them to live, demonstrating love and mercy and grace. Am I telling the truth today? Yep. No. The only thing that will help the church to be what the church is meant to be is a return to the Word of God. Amen. Preaching the Word of God. And when you preach the Word of God, my friend, you are not preaching Republican conspiracy. You are not preaching Donald Trump. You are not preaching hate these people or hate those people. You are not preaching divisiveness. You are not preaching division. You are not stirring up angst and anger and malice. Not when you preach the Word of God. The Word of God doesn't do any of those things. We must go back if we are to move ahead. Amen. I hope you've been able to get something from this message. Like I said, this is really as much a prophetic message for the church universal as it is a word for the individual. If you're in a place in your relationship with God and you feel like you're stuck, say, Lord, I don't know why, but I... I just don't feel like I'm advancing in my walk with you. I don't feel like I'm, I'm, I'm moving forward in my relationship with you. Then let me encourage you today. 
to go back a little bit, take a look, try to find where's that old path that used to work for me. You know, there was a time in in the church, there was a time in my walk with God where I didn't sit around judging everybody, where I didn't sit around getting mad at everybody, where I didn't sit around getting offended at everything everybody said, where I used to love people because they were human like I was, but bless God, they were trying to live for the Lord, and I didn't look at others in the church and label them hypocrites. Hello now. Right, right. Hello now. Maybe you need to go back and find that old path again. Maybe that's the, the path you ought to be walking on, the one that you hadn't been on for a while. And that's why you're stuck. Go back a little bit so you can move forward. Hallelujah. Oh, praise the Lord. Would you stand with me this afternoon?